Hi there, I'm Mila Atmos, the host of Future Hindsight, an award-winning podcast that takes big ideas about civic life and democracy and turns them into action items for you and me. In this midterm year, we're bringing you conversations that can truly support your decision-making beyond the horse race. Join us every Thursday for in-depth conversations with citizen changemakers about how they're building their civic action toolkits. You'll always learn something new and come away with hope and inspiration to bolster our democracy. Follow Future Hindsight wherever you listen to podcasts or tune in on futurehindsight.com. They doubled down once they were wrong. And in fact, the more wrong they felt, the more they doubled down on their beliefs. Again, suggesting that we're not as open-minded as, as we think we are. The Village Square, a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that disagreement and dialogue make for a good conversation, a good country, and a good time. At the Village Square, we talk about politics, religion, and race. You know, the topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. Listen, at the Village Square, we make pigs fly. Welcome to Village Squarecast. This is Vanessa Rouse. Thanks for joining us for Intellectual Humility in a Polarized World with Dr. Kurt Gray. Now you might be wondering, what exactly is this talk going to be about? So check it out. Today, we all get to learn how we're not as right as we think we are. And even if you've accepted that general reality, I think Kurt's going to push you to consider that you might actually be more wrong than you think you are. Mind blowing, I know. Kurt is a social psychologist and an award-winning researcher and professor who uses interdisciplinary methods to study our deepest held beliefs and how to bridge moral divides. He's an associate professor in psychology and neuroscience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he directs the Deepest Beliefs Lab, which studies beliefs around morality and religion. He also directs the Center for the Science of Moral Understanding. And if that's not enough to convince you that this talk is going to be awesome, Kurt is the co-author of the book called The Mind Club, Who Thinks, What Feels, and Why It Matters. Stay tuned for a fascinating story towards the end about how Kurt ended up co-authoring this book with his mentor from Harvard, Dr. Daniel Wegner. All right, so first up, Kurt's going to spend about 25 minutes or so breaking it down for us on this topic of intellectual humility and how we're all more wrong than we think. That's right. I'm looking at you, too, through the airwaves. Can you feel it? Then we're going to bring in our very own executive director of our Tallahassee operations, Christine White, to put Kurt on the spot with some timely and intriguing questions about how we can use our newfound intellectual humility to help build human connections and bridge our divides. As Christine says, Kurt is basically the Village Square personified, so you're in for a real treat today. And have I mentioned, Kurt is super entertaining while telling us we're wrong. All right, before we get started, we'd like to give a big shout out to our friends at Florida Humanities, for partnering with us to present this podcast series. Okay, let's turn it over to Dr. Kurt Gray. All right, thank you. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about intellectual humility. And so, I don't know if you know, but it's pretty bad out there when it comes to politics, right? It's hard to find agreement when we're having conversations Our Thanksgiving dinner tables uh, are filled with contentious conversations. One study that came out a couple years ago that uh, I found really interesting was that if there were cross-partisans at the dinner table, so liberals and conservatives, those dinners ended half an hour early. (laughs) 
And so that means that people gave up pie, which it, I couldn't imagine a worse fate for America, right? That's the best part of Thanksgiving in my mind. So uh, it, it's pretty bad. And for the first time uh, really ever, out-group hate is, is stronger than in-group love. So it used to be that you just love your own side, right, your own candidate, and you just didn't like the other person as a consequence that they weren't your own person. But now you just hate the other side, and then you just say, well, I guess our guy is good enough because I don't like the other guy, right, which is obviously not a great place to be for politics. And so uh, one reason I think discourse is so bad is because we're so cocky about it. Right, everyone's this dude. We're like, actually, let me tell you about politics. Like, I know you think you know what's going on, but like, really, I know what's going on, and let me tell you, right? We're sorely lacking in intellectual humility. And so, this is what this talk is about. Uh, it's about intellectual humility, and I'm trying to convince you that maybe we could be all uh, a little more, a little more humble. And so, in a nutshell, it's just the idea that you could be wrong. Right? This is what this whole talk is about. Right, you could be wrong, and you probably are, and we're going to spend half an hour just showing you how wrong you are about so many things, and then you're going to go home, and then hopefully remember that sometime when you're talking politics or talking with your spouse, or they'll probably remind you though, uh, and, or talking with your kids, whatever. Right, so you're probably wrong. That's what the gist of the talk is. All right, and so the the reason you're probably wrong is because. Uh, our minds did not evolve to be right about a lot of things. They didn't evolve to kind of like see the ultimate truth, right? They evolved just to, to keep us mostly alive, just to keep us alive as best we could in an, or, in an environment that's very different from eating in a, in, a, in a buffet, right? This is not typical of our evolutionary past, okay? And so we, we evolved to make good enough judgments about a number of very concrete domains. Questions like, should I eat this mushroom? That's something that our evolutionary ancestors faced, right? There's a mushroom. Should I eat it? I don't know. Is it yummy or will I die? Uh, should I mock this big warrior from another tribe? Maybe, if you're feeling real tough. I don't know. Should I pet that bear? Right? Those are the kind of things that our minds evolved to do. And, and those are the things that, that, that we presumably should be really good at. And yeah, and, and this guy dies taking a picture with a bear. Right? Like, this is literally, literally why our minds, how our minds evolved to answer these questions. Okay? So, so what does this mean for really complicated things that we have to face today? Right? Like, statistical relations, causal connections, right? All these complicated things that, that we're trying to figure out when it comes to political policy, right? They're much more complicated than should I pet a bear? And so it suggests that we might not be as correct and should be confident as we maybe are in our judgments about these things. And so the, the, the problem is, is that our minds also evolved to make us feel confident about things. We feel like we know what's going on, right? In fact, we, we even use this word like, well, we, I just see it. I just, it's as plain as day. There's lots of things like that where we, we think we see it, right? We think we know, uh, but in fact, we don't. And so when we look at the world, we think we see the world for as it is. And we think that we are, in general, uh, dispassionate, we are open to new evidence, we are independent, and we are insightful. And probably everyone here thinks of them as that way. This is why we are here, because we're open to these things, right? We're open to discourse. But we can always be better, and I'm going to suggest that, it, that you may not be as, as much of these things as you think you are, okay? Uh, so when it, it, you know, it comes to being dispassionate, right, we all think like we're the cool, calm, collective people. We see... Social media videos, people like screaming at each other, right? And you're like, I'm, I'm zen, right? I'm, you're yelling, I'm calm. I'm chill. But, but here's the thing. It's hard to think rationally about all sorts of policies, right? If, if you're thinking about immigration, right, should we separate children from their parents at the border? Should we make kids cry, right? Think of your own kids. Do you want them to be separated from you? Is there a benefit of that policy? There could be. Right? There might be. Some, many people would argue that there is, right, of that policy. But it's hard for us to think critically about these things when our emotions are engaged. Or imagine I say, Lay, let's think critically about maybe we should loosen child pornography laws. Maybe we, you know, we should just like get more child porn out there, and that'll make the world a better place. I don't think that's true, 
but it, you could argue in some ways that, that it is, right? Like a free enterprise society, I, you know, there's a market for it, you can control it. We kind of did the same with marijuana, it used to be seen as a vice. Again, I'm not saying that this is a good thing, but it's really hard to think critically about this because our gut feeling when we think of this is that that's terrible, right? That's terrible. Our emotions get involved, right? Our sense of morality gets involved, and it's hard to think critically about it. And so if you think about, you know, kind of how we reason about things, we use our brain, right? And we, use, we generally think that good reasoning is not the same as just like this powerful gut emotional feeling, right? But can we separate them? Well, let's look at the brain science. So uh, there was this large-scale meta-analysis, which is like an analysis of all the studies. It's like a study of all the studies. And it looked at what regions are the brain, what regions of the brain are active when we're feeling emotion. And I like this study because my wife was the one who, who did this study. It's called the Brain Basis of Emotion. Do a plug for my, my wife. Um, and these are the areas involved. And I'm not going to go into the, the neural structures, but the takeaway is it's a lot of color. Right? Like that, that's all I understand about the brain. Right? Lots of color. Because emotion hits everywhere in your brain, basically, when you're feeling it. And so when you're feeling powerful about something, you can't think critically or rationally often about what you're thinking about. And so if you feel strongly, right, it means you are not dispassionate. You are less dispassionate than you think. What about being open to new evidence? We think one reason why we're here is because we're open to evidence, right? Like, tell me new things about myself. You're open to maybe being right, wrong. And so let's imagine that you make a, 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 a contentious claim, a claim that you know is going to be disagreed with. Cats are smarter than dogs. Maybe you're a cat person. I have a cat. I'm not sure this is true, uh, but I do have a cat. And you say, look, cats are smarter than dogs, but I, like, look, the brain evidence shows that dogs are smarter. They have twice the neurons of cats, and we usually think of neurons as leading to smartness. And it's also the case that dogs are more social. They're pack animals. They can learn faster. Right? So, so dogs are smarter. But, look, if, if, you're, if you're a cat person, you, you're immediately not like, oh, yeah, you're right. Like, my cat is an idiot. No, right? You don't think that at all. You're like, well, well. Well, like, cats just, they don't want to learn. They're getting along just fine without learning, so they don't want to learn, right? Or they're just like, they know enough already. They're born knowing things, and so, so take your evidence and, and go away, science man. Um, or they're just too cool, right? They're aloof. You know, they're cool. They don't need to do the thing. Like, they don't need to win your approval, they don't need to get treats, they don't care, right? And so if I give you evidence against your belief, you don't just say, yeah, you're right. Instead you say, but there's all these reasons why you're wrong and why I should ignore this evidence, right? And so this is called cognitive dissonance, right? Basically the idea is that once you have a belief that's challenged, you feel bad because you think of yourself as knowing how things go, you feel bad about how things are, Right? And, and what you do is you discredit that evidence so you feel less bad. All right? So you reject that evidence, and you actually what you do is you double down on your original thing. Right? You come at me with more facts about how cats are better. Right? You don't actually stop thinking, yeah, yeah, it could be right. Yeah, brains, yeah, dogs are smarter. Right? And so it's funny when it, when it comes to cats and dogs, but when it comes to politics, right, it, it's really important. Right? Because as soon as you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach, you don't think, oh, yeah. I guess I better stop and listen and really think about the beliefs that I hold. Instead, you just think, no, you're wrong, and here's why. And so there's an example in social psychology that I really love. It's not about politics. It's about the end of the world. And so what this social psychologist did, Leon Fessinger, uh, if you know kind of social psych, is he went into a doomsday cult, and he recorded their kind of reactions. And they said, look, the world is going to end in a month. And so you know, he like hung out with them waiting for the world to end, and they sold their possessions. They told their family members, you know, uh, I love you. They told their bosses, to, you know, to go screw. And, you know, they just, like, they ended things, right? They're, like, ready to get picked up by the spaceship. And then when the, and when the day came, the spaceship didn't come. And then what did they do? So they come back to their family, and they're like, oh, turns out I was wrong. And they tell their boss, like, sorry for lipping off try to get their stuff back. No, they were like, oh yeah, we just misinterpreted a little bit. It's ending in a month, another month. 
And so they, they doubled down once they were wrong. And in fact, the more wrong they felt, the more they doubled down on their beliefs. Right? Again, suggesting that we're not as open-minded as, as we think we are. And so you may think, let's think about it, right? What do you think your chances are for justifying like this? Right? What do you think the chances are that you would do something so irrational? Maybe you think it's lower than average, right? Or higher, than, sorry, yeah. It's, you're more likely to be open-minded than the average person. After all, we're here, right? We're all here, open-minded people. But what about compared to people in this room? You probably looking around, you're probably like, well, I know some of these people. They're, they're fine people. They tell nice stories, but I don't think they're as open-minded as I am. I'm more open-minded than they are, right? And so this is called the better than average effect. No matter what domain you think about, people always think they're better than average, unless it's juggling, because no one thinks they're good jugglers. But for everything that matters, people think that they're better than average, okay? So compared to people in this room, like think about your intelligence. You want to think that you're better than average of intelligence, right? But of course, the best bet is going to, and half of you are lower than average in intelligence in this room, right? Just, it has to be that way, right? Take it from me, I teach statistics. Half of you are below average intelligence for this room, right? That has to be the case. It all has to be the case that half of you are below average intelligence in driving skill, in lovemaking ability. College students love this. I'm like half of you here are, are less than average kissers. And it cuts them to their core, right? But it's true, statistically speaking, right? Half the people here have to be like not as good at sex as the other half of the people here. Because statistically speaking, that's how it works. The funny thing is, is if you tell people this thing, this effect, and then you ask them, how likely are you to fall prey to the better than average effect? They will say, less than average. <laughs> But right, you just told them about this effect, right? So this is how powerful this effect is, right? Once people, right, you feel good about yourself. You want to have self-esteem, and so you think of yourself as better than average. And so if you're better than average, right, you don't have to listen to anybody because you know you're right and they're wrong. And so part of the better than average effect feeds into our lack of humility. And so maybe you think you're too thoughtful to make these mistakes, right? You're the kind of person who like really pauses and reflects all right, so I'm going to present some, some, some kind of simple problems, on, and I want you to give me the answer as quickly as you can because they're so simple, simple right? It's going to be obvious. Are ready? All right. A bat and a ball cost a dollar ten in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? How much does the boss? Ten cents? Ten cents? Ten cents? Ten cents? Right? Your intuition is 10 cents, but it's 5 cents. It's 5 cents, right? <laughs> it's 5 cents. Because if it's 10 cents and a dollar more than 10 cents, then it ends up being a dollar 20, right? Uh, but it's a dollar 10. So it turns out that, that most people get this wrong, right? Because they go with their gut impression. Uh, here's another one. In a lake, there's a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in sizes. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half the lake? You're like, too much math. I've had too much wine for this kind of bullshit. <laughs> Fair answer. Fair answer. But the answer is 47. That's right, because it doubles. But what you feel is the answer is 24, right? It's half of that. So this is called the cognitive reflection task. It's used a ton uh, in social psychology and behavioral economics to show that basically like people have a gut intuition about how the world works kind of math. And then once you think about it, you're like, oh, yeah, it's not, it's not quite right. And so you're fine to be corrected for something dumb like this, like lily pads, right? But, but people don't stop and think about their opinions about, like, I don't know, any kind of policy, economic policy, taxes, right, minimum wage, it doesn't matter, right, immigration. People never think, like, oh, I could be wrong, let's think about it, right? They're just like, I know it, I'm right, let's go with it. And so people are motivated to see themselves not as set in their beliefs or worse than average or particularly thoughtless, Right? And that's a bad thing because it leads us uh, not to consider that we might be wrong. Right? We're not as smart as we think we are, is the punchline. All right. So, what about the last one? Independent. Who here, if put in the middle of the forest, could survive alone? 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. I can nail it, right? So this guy, he's Canadian. Uh, his name is Les Stroud. He's, he's called Survivor Man. If you know, like, a Man vs. Wild, like, that show is total BS. This guy's the real deal. He goes out into the wilderness by himself with a camera and films himself. I think he did uh, 11 or 12 episodes of this show because it was so hard on his body, he was afraid that he would die. Because it's so hard to be by yourself in the wilderness. We are a social species. We need other people to survive, right? Like, if there wasn't food there, what would we do? We'd, like, look around each other and probably eat the weakest person here, right? <laughs> because we wouldn't know what to do. Because that we're a social species, right? We depend upon others to live. And so what this means is that we need people to survive, right? That's how we evolved through, through, through history, right? We formed groups, we specialized, we did all sorts of things like that. And so what that means is that we get our self-esteem from what other people think of us, right? Our self-esteem is a kind of barometer of like how much do other people like us. And if they don't like you, you're worried about it because you're worried that they're going to kick you out of the group and then you're just going to have to eat grubs out of a tree and then eventually die in the wilderness, right? That's why we have self-esteem, it's argued. Right, because we need to know what other people think of us. And so what that means is that when we think about our beliefs, we generally like to believe in the same things that our groups do so that they think that we're right and they respect us and they believe in what we believe in and we feel good about ourselves, right? So it just so happens if you are born as a, as a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints, you will probably believe what they believe. And if you were born to some hippie parents, then you will believe probably more what they believe, and maybe you rebel, fine. But for the most part, people believe what their parents believe, and that makes them feel good to know that they're part of a community, right? We all believe the same things here about kind of being open-minded, and I think that's a great thing, but it's also a kind of group truth that we accept, right? Because it makes us feel good about ourselves to be accepted. And so, again, our minds aren't made for discovering the truth, they're made for kind of like believing what our friends and family members believe in general. I'm not saying that it's not the truth. I'm not, not saying that we shouldn't be open-minded. I'm just saying that it's a powerful force. And of course, social media uh, makes it worse, right? Because we're trapped in these echo chambers, because media companies want us to be trapped in echo chambers, because we get angry at each other, etc. right? You've probably heard about the ills of social media. This is not that talk. But all I'm saying is that it reinforces the kind of power of these group truths. Now you may think, look, I know the truth. I'm pretty smart. I did school things. I talk to friends. I come to intellectual events like this. I know the truth, right? I know how the world works, right? You've like been around for a little bit. You know how the world works. You've figured it out. You know the kind of like mechanisms of the world. And look, you're like, look, the economy, politics, it's complicated, but I've got it figured out. I know how things work. Do you though? Do you though? Put up your hand if you've never seen a bike. Excellent. On the table in front of you, you will find a piece of paper and a pen. I would like you to draw a bicycle, don't look at anybody else, don't look at your phone, in sufficient detail that I would know how it works. So the mechanics, a working bicycle, okay? All right, don't look, don't cheat. I'm looking, I'm a college professor. No looking around, draw a bike. <laughs> I'm laughing with you, I'm laughing with you. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. All right. I don't, I don't think I've seen one yet that works. <laughs> All right. Lots of bikes, lots of bikes. So, Maybe you, your bike looks, I'm not even going to show you the real bike. You can take your piece of paper home and compare it with the bike. But, but almost no one gets it right. Almost no one gets it right. Like, the frame is really, it's two triangles put together, and then one kind of front fork, and a chain that goes from the pedals to the back tire, right? And so, maybe, maybe 10%, maybe, maybe 20%, right? But, it, but, it, but if I told you, do you know how a bike works? You look at me like, are you an idiot? Of course I know how a bike works, right? I've ridden a bike before, I see them every day. But when I ask you to draw it, you can't typically, right? Or we don't have to do a bike, we can do a zipper or a toilet, right? Things you think you know because you see them, like, do I know? I give this talk, I don't know how a zipper works. It's not so easy, right? Even though if you think you do. So the point of this is we have something called an illusion of explanatory depth. There we go. 
So we have this illusion in our minds that we know how things work, that we can like think deeply about, about explanations. And yet when we're confronted with actually how to explain things, like if you have a two-year-old, for instance, like I do, always asking why, you realize you don't really know why. It's like, it, that's just a bike. It's just a bike works. Stop asking me questions, right? And so it's important to understand this when we're thinking about politics, right? Because you're thinking about uh, like fiscal policies, right? You're like, this is best for the American or global economy. You don't know how a bike works. <laughs> right? Like, may maybe it's good to have some humility about how the economy works, right? Or like the, the global economy. You're like, I, I, you know, what is money, right? It that's even hard to understand, let alone a bike, right? So what I'm saying is like, there's lots of issues that are more complicated than how a bike works. And so when we're discussing them and we're thinking about them, it's good to have a sense that we maybe don't have as much explanatory depth as we think we might. All right. And so the illusion of explanatory depth kind of keeps us complacent, right? Because we assume we know how things work. We don't try to figure it out. We don't try to wonder if we're wrong. And so it, it keeps us kind of complacent and it keeps us in a little box uh, in, with our blinders. And so I'm going to give you one, one more example of how this can keep us in, in our box. What people try to do is they have a hunch and then they try to confirm that hunch. They try to prove themselves right. No one ever tries to prove themselves wrong. No one ever thinks like, I think this is a wrong guess. Let's throw it out there. Because that's not how psychology works, right? You're like, I don't want to look like an idiot. I know I'm right. I'm just going to show that I'm right. And this is called the conf confirmation bias or confirmatory bias, right? You have an idea. You want to confirm it. You talk to people who you know, and they confirm it, right? Th this is how people work on social media, on the internet, with their friends, right? You know you're right, and you just keep on asking people until someone tells you that you're right, and then you're done. Right? You know you're smarter than average. You know you know how the world works. And so you're just going to wait for someone to tell you that you're right, and then you're done. This is not a good way to, to have civil discourse. It's not a good way to run a country, right? to have a working political system, right? because everyone just tries to confirm that they're already right. And if you're already right, then why are you even talking to someone else? Right? Why would you even have a conversation right? for someone who disagrees with you because you know that they're wrong? Well, maybe they're not wrong. Right? Maybe you're wrong. I don't know how wrong, but it's worth considering that maybe we're all a little wrong. And so wh what we need to do is we need to try to disconfirm our beliefs a little bit more than we do. And it's not human nature to go out there and just be like, I think I'm wrong about everything. Someone tell me how I'm wrong about everything. But you could think about how you're wrong at the margins at least. That's a good start, right? You could ask people to be devil's advocate, people you know and trust. Right? Maybe people that, you know, this is what I think. You think I could be wrong, right? In a safe, in a safe uh, environment. You could connect with people you disagree with. So I know part of the, the mission of this dinner is that. Uh, and maybe actually read the original evidence. So as a scientist, I think that this is super important, right? Don't read the, the internet coverage of something. If you can, read the original things. And so, right, be humble because you could be wrong. Now, we're almost done, but, but some, there's some recent research, speaking of reading the original research, that came out that I think that deserves an epilogue here, okay? And that is, look, I've hopefully convinced you that you're less dispassionate, you're less open to evidence, you're less independent, and you're less insightful than you previously thought. Whoa, downer, downer of a dinner, right? Uh, boo, my mind is broken. But, but now you're like, but now I'm, I'm humble. I'm humble. And so you're like, look, I understand intellectual humility. That's, that's like a piece of the puzzle like for us to put America together, right? And then you start saying things like, well, I, I, I could be wrong about this, or I haven't really read the original evidence, right? Now you're starting to, like, to be humble. You're starting to be humble. And yeah, can anyone tell me uh, what this is from? Pride and prejudice, right? The perfect pairing for intellectual humility. Because now you're doing, like, look, I could be wrong. Look, I'm so humble. And they're not humble. <laughs> right? I went to this dinner, I heard this dude, he talked about how my brain wasn't as good as I thought it was, and I understand that, and so I know I could be wrong, but those people, they're not humble. They're arrogant assholes, not like me, right? They're wrong, and I'm, I'm a little wrong, but at least I know I'm wrong, and they have no idea, right? They're unenlightened. 
And so it turns out, in a weird thing, right, the more you think that you're intellectually humble, the more you think you belong to a group of humble people, it turns into a social identity, right? You're like, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm a humble person, and everyone else is an idiot, right? Which is usually, I think, actually, unfortunately, what people, when you give a talk on intellectual humility, they walk out of their thinking, right? Or like, now I'm humble. And so, if you're more humble, right, then you're more humble than other people. Well, hum- humility is a, uh, a good thing. It's a virtue, right? More humble, better than other people, and more prideful, right? So this is the weird thing about intellectual humility. Humility is supposed to be opposite pride, but it's, it's the one thing that often leads powerfully to pride. So in the quest for humility, and, and that's the important thing, it's a quest, right? And they become more prejudiced against people who are not humble in their own mind, right? So intellectual humility is not something that you just, that you become, Right? It's not something that you just are. Because if you are it, then that means you're humbler than everybody else. You get to be cocky. You get to be that guy with the twirly mustache at the beginning who looks like a jerk. Right? Intellectual humility is instead is a, it's a continual aspiration that we're trying to be. Right? Continually reminding ourselves that maybe we could be wrong. Maybe we could be wrong. And to keep thinking that. And you're never fully humble. Right? It's just something to keep on aspiring to be. And so the, the last thing we'll talk about is, is who's the smartest person that you can think of in all of society? And I primed you, so you're going to tell me this person, probably. Einstein, right? I, if you're like, who's the smart person? You're like, Einstein. Dude came up with two kinds of relativity. You probably haven't come up with any. I haven't, right? He came up with special relativity and general relativity, right? Figured out the speed of light, all sorts of crazy things. So Einstein was pretty smart, granted. But he also thought... Uh, he discovered relativity, he thought that quantum mechanics was wrong. He was like, there's no way that quantum mechanics is a thing. It, I just don't believe it. It's not real. Right? The smartest person in the world didn't believe in quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics is reality. It's a thing. Everyone agrees now. Right? So Einstein was very confident about his belief and was very smart, but was ultimately wrong about the, the, the deepest nature of reality. And so as you go forward, think not of just pride and prejudice, but also think of Einstein being wrong. And you think, look, I'm very confident in my belief. You can ask yourself, am I smarter than Einstein? Who was ultimately wrong about physics, the one thing he knew the most about? And if you think that maybe you are not as smart as Einstein, maybe because you're not sure how a bike totally works, that's okay, right? But it just means that we need to be a little more humble about ourselves and keep on aspiring to have intellectual humility. Thanks for listening. Wow. I don't know about you all, but I am thoroughly humbled, but not too humble. I don't know. Now I'm scared to, <laughs> I'm scared to just be. Thank you, Kurt. You gave us a lot of food for thought there. So I just wanted to kick it off with your background, because like I said originally, you are the Village Square personified. I think you all would agree with me now that the work that he does, and if you delve in a little bit more, if you did any research on him and the the Deepest Beliefs Lab and the center that he works with, it's so very Village Square. So I'm curious, and I think a lot of us are here tonight, is how did you get into this area of study that's so very specific and... Very important. So I was, re- I was really a geophysicist. Kind of, so I have some humility because my path was very random. Uh, growing up, my friend's dad was a geophysicist, and he was buff and had a beautiful girlfriend. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a geophysicist. Very shallow. Um, and eventually decided I like people more than, than rocks. But growing up, I had a, a, my stepmom was from Nebraska, and they have a really big family. And they're um, evangelical Christians. They're very conservative. And I'm Canadian. Grew up relatively more progressive. And as a kid, we went down there and we drove from from Halifax, Nova Scotia, like you know, on the East Coast, to Nebraska in a K car without air conditioning in the dead of summer. So I learned some humility that way. But it, when I got there, it was clear we had a ton in common, my cousins and I. Right? We, we were 10 years old, and we loved firecrackers and swimming and playing in the barn, and, and it seemed like you know we, we were 100% compatible. And then as I got older, it became clear that like, maybe we didn't have as much in common when it came to politics, right? about the acceptability of gay marriage, about all sorts of things. So 
I became a psychologist, but I always kept on thinking of like, why am I drifting so far apart from these folks who I know are kind and I know are accepting of, of me as a, you know, a, a step kid, um, and yet fundamentally disagree about so many important things politically. And so that kind of experience made me think like, huh, like, I know they're good people, but we disagree, and so how can I make sense of disagreement even though we're all good people? So that's the genesis. Yeah, that's very interesting. And you talked to us a little bit about um, our blind spots, which can impede our own humility. So how do we how do we do that though? How do we really identify our blind spots? Because I think I think sometimes when we're looking at something, we realize, oh yeah, maybe maybe I have a little blind spot there, but. How do we very realistically identify that within ourselves? And then what do we do with it? What's, mm. you know, what's kind of the next step in order to make the progress forward? Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a big question. It's a very important question. So I think it, it's hard to recognize your blind spots just sitting there, right? So the, I guess the reason I'm a psychologist instead of philosopher, is because philosophers, you just kind of sit there and you're just, you think, right, as hard as you can, but sometimes you need other people, right, to, to kind of like make you realize what your beliefs are. And so I think one way to identify our blind spots is to be curious. And so right now in, in, in the lab, we're working on this kind of like moral curiosity, right? Like some people are more morally curious than others. Right? You folks are probably not to, you know, make you feel uh, prideful, but are probably more morally curious than others, right? Like, like you want to know, like, well, how could someone think that about uh, abortion, Im immigration, capital punishment, right? Marijuana, whatever. It doesn't matter, right? I think that curiosity, which I think exists in kids, you know, I see it in my kids. Um, it kind of gets like sliced out of us as we um, as we kind of like deepen in our political identities. But I think that's the kind of the kind of uh, I'm not going to say a, a panacea, but I think it's an important step to kind of like understanding your blind spots, like wondering and asking how people believe what they believe. And then once you have that understanding. I think once you understand that someone who believes something different than you is a human being and getting into conversations with them, I think that, that that's where you go. I think that's how you solve it, right? You have meaningful contact with someone who disagrees with you. And then once you have that, then, then I think we're on the road to making America better. But it's really hard because we're separated in many ways. So what you're saying is we engage with the village square more often and, well, <laughs> and what, what we're doing here. So you all are one step, yeah, we're all one step true. in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, I heard you on a podcast recently talking about the, the concept of a harmless wrong. Mm -hmm. Can something be harmless but immoral? Um, and speaking in political terms, you know, kind of thinking of our divides, are there some simply unbridgeable moral divides between, say, liberals and conservatives? I think the answer to both those questions is no. There's no such thing as a harmless wrong, and for that reason, there's no unbridgeable moral divides. And so there, <laughs> I don't know how, like, this is, a, this is a deep rabbit, you can't tell right now, but there's like a thousand foot rabbit hole right here that we could jump down. I'm not going to jump. I'm just going to break off my ankle. I'm not going to jump all the way down on there. So, you know, different ideas about morality. And so the kind of idea of morality that I've been studying in my lab is that ultimately it all comes down to how we understand what's harmful in the world. So even if we have different values that we emphasize, those values ultimately become moralized values, right? Questions of morality, of right and wrong, of good and evil, because we link them to harm because we link them to you know, protecting our kids, protecting our families, protecting our society. And so it's a kind of common currency when we think about morality. So if someone disagrees with you about morality, if you can, if you can kind of like figure out, well, well, why do they think that? It almost always comes down to harm, right? And so I've run a lot of studies on, let's say, the, the gun debate. And so if you're pro-gun, it's typically because, right, th th there's a, there's, there's many things, right? It's a complex issue, right? But there's often always this kind of story of like, well, you know, you can use a gun to protect yourself in a certain circumstance, right? To protect your family. Um, if, if you're a prepper, right? You're like, I need guns because when the world goes terrible, I need to defend myself, right? Um, and if you're, if you're pro-gun control, then you think, well, just think of all the kids who, who get shot from guns in the home, right? Like they're not properly cared for or, or secured or whatever. 
or school shootings, right? And typically, it, it, it doesn't matter what issue we're talking about, it's about harm. And so when you think about this idea of, of harmless wrongs, they don't really exist. Something only seems like a harmless wrong if you yourself don't think of it as wrong. And so the, to really hit it home, I'll give you the example of gay marriage. Uh, and I wrote an op-ed about this some time ago now after the Supreme Court case passed the gay marriage law. And so there was a North Carolina pastor named Michael Barrett who said that failure to ban gay marriage would be the equivalent of a nuclear holocaust. Wow. Those are strong words. And certainly some exaggeration. We can understand, right? But, but among the evangelical right, there was this perception that passing gay marriage would cause harm to kids, right? That, that, that maybe kids would decide it's fun to be gay and, and, and right, like they would get equal, equal rights and then the people wouldn't have kids and then the society would kind of bottom out, no one would pay taxes and then, you know, destruction. And I'm, you know, there's some ellipses in there, right? We're like sketching over some of the, the mechanism. But they legitimately perceived harm. And so I wrote this op-ed uh, about my research that shows that people see harm in response to moral violations, even if they seem harmless you know, to other people. If you think they're wrong, they seem, you see harm within seconds, within seconds. And so I published this op-ed in the Times, and lots of liberals kind of wrote to me and said, you're an asshole, basically. Right, like you know, conservatives don't really see harm. They're just inventing this rhetoric to like make us angry. But then I got a bunch of emails from more conservative folks, like one pastor uh, down south, and he said, "Thank you for recognizing my moral stance is grounded not only in God's word, but God's word is about what protects us from harm." Right, for recognizing my my views. So I think if we understand the kind of importance and ubiquity of harm in our moral judgments, then we can we can understand that everyone wants to protect their families and society from harm. They just think you go about it in a different way. And I think that's a, a good first step. Absolutely. Thank you. So you talked to us here tonight about, about correcting bias and, you know, kind of a key way to help move us in the right direction. So is this something like a, you know, we're all trying to instill healthier habits in our lives or, you know, live a happier life. Is this something that we can actually work on practicing? Do we need, you know, do we need the, the correcting bias personal trainer or, <laughs> or accountability partner? Do we need to, you know, journal about it? How do we do this in a real way that, um, that can really move the needle forward? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And it, it's tough, right? Because we all, you know, you, it's a powerful source of self-esteem to know that we're right. I mean, if people want to want to text me, be like, hey, Kurt, am I wrong? I'll just be like, yes. <laughs> what about yes? And what, no, still yes, right? I mean, I, again, going back to the curiosity part, right, it, you can kind of learn about how other people think differently than you, and if you have the kind of fortitude, you can ask people to play a, a devil's advocate, right? You can think, like, not am I wrong, because that's tough. It's maybe, in what ways might not I be 100% correct? Just a little bit wrong. And the, the trick is to find someone that you feel comfortable with asking that, right? Maybe it's your spouse. It's, it's not for me, <laughs> right? Right, you're like, am I wrong, honey? Yes. Yes, you're wrong. Like, thank God you finally recognized it. Um, but you, like, mean, you, know, you mean the neuroscientist calls you wrong? <laughs> yeah, that's right. But right, I mean, this dinner's a, a, a great place, right? Even with someone who like shares many of your beliefs, there, there's often kind of like divergence, right? Like there's, there's an illusion of, uh, of, of uniformity in our beliefs, right? Even if the folks you know are mostly progressive or mostly conservative, right? There's still people, you know, there's still disagreement about the fringes. And you can start making sense of that disagreement around the fringes, right? And so I think that, yeah, again, the first step is to be curious about disagreement and then trying to put yourself out there and wonder how you might be a, a little bit wrong about something that's maybe less important. And then you can kind of feed back and maybe think like, oh, that's some more important things that might be wrong as well. Yeah. And so that really applies to, because what we talk about, what we hear, do here at the Village Square, what our mission is, it is not to change each other's minds. It's not to, you know, come away from a gathering like this and be like, oh, I think, you know, so-and-so at the table who believed opposite of me on that topic, I think I might have brought them over onto my side. Mm. It's not about that. It's really about having healthy, respectful disagreements 
that bring more compassion, listening, coming with, we were talking, you know, earlier about coming with an open heart and an open mind. So where does the, you know, where does the, we can see kind of naturally where humility plays into that. Um, because you, you need to come to the table, right? With a little bit more humility, but I guess, how do we, how do we see that playing into, um, you know, engagements like this or where when we come together, Village Square on a hot topic, uh, we have an event coming up soon that's on, um, the topic of voter rights versus voter security, uh, and there, so when it is a very divided topic, how do we, you know, how does all of this play into that to really have, I guess, positive effects and not, not just kind of drive, like you said, you know, the risk of driving the divide even deeper? Mm-hmm. Yeah, first I want to agree that, that no one's saying you should get rid of your moral convictions, right? Or that pluralism isn't important. Right, like a democracy is founded on pluralism. You need different opinions, and it's about some kind of finding compromise among those uh, among those opinions. But but ultimately, for passing policy, for instance, right, you you need to agree on something, right? You need to find some kind of hopefully middle road, uh, even if it's not exactly in the middle, right? And, and for that, I think you need a kind of like pragmatic attitude, a kind of can-do um, spirit that 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 comes from humility. And so one, I guess, a couple things. One thing to think about when it comes to hot button issues is that we generally actually agree on like 99% of things, right? We generally, like child abuse is bad, embezzlement's bad, voting is good, democracy is good. I think, right, like we, we can slam elites if you want to, but everyday people, right? We, we generally agree about almost everything, right? We agree that like, People's voices should be heard, and, and the elections should be secure. But I think we forget about that like massive reservoir of agreement when we're like disagreeing about the kind of hot button issues. So one is kind of like remind yourself of those things, and also remind the other people that you you do are fundamentally a, a moral person. And so I'll, I'll tell you about a study we ran in the lab, and I'm kind of like sad that it worked as well as it did, but. But, but basically, we have, this, we have this effect called a basic morality bias. And so it's always been the case that if someone disagrees with you on a particular issue, you think their stance on that issue is wrong. If you're pro-life, you think someone who's pro-choice is wrong. But if I ask you, like, what do you think they, they think about cheating on their spouse? What do you think they think about like stealing a million dollars from their company? It used to be that you'd just be like, I think they think that those things are bad. Right, like we disagree on abortion, but they have a kind of basic moral core. Well, increasingly, people don't believe that anymore. Right, that they don't think the other side has a moral core. So we ask people, we ask Republicans about Democrats and Democrats about Republicans, like how many people on the other side think it's acceptable to to have child pornography. People think the answer is like fifteen percent. Right, fifteen percent of people on the other side like think that child pornography is acceptable. What? That's that's crazy, right? The, the real answer is like less than 1%. And, and so, you know, that, that spells trouble for, for divides, right? For embezzlement, cheating on your spouse, whatever. Like the effects are, are huge. But it turns out that there's a really simple intervention for remedying that bias, which is just reminding people that, that you have a basic moral compass. And so, <laughs> you know, we joke about this in the lab being like, hi, I'm Kirk. I think that adultery and child pornography is wrong. What's your name, right? I mean, that just sounds so dumb, but at the same time, right? We, like, we're at a place where we kind of like remind people of our, our kind of like basic moral core. So I think conversations about our similarity and about our shared values, right, uh, are an important place to start when we have these hot button topics. We're like, look, we all agree on the same things and we're all basically moral, but we're just disagreeing about this like kind of margin, an important margin, but still disagreement. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned social media, you kind of glossed over it earlier, but that is something that we, you know, at least inside the village square, we focus on a lot because it is just (laughs) such a double edged sword. Um, how much do you all focus on that, you know, in your studies and your like, 
we get what it's doing in a negative way. Um, and it's not getting any better. It's getting worse. It's making us more tribal. It's making us, you know, just kind of rant, quote, anonymously, or at least behind this, you know, not person to person. So it's not going away. What do we do about this? And that is not encouraging humility or any of these good things. No. <laughs> Stay away. I mean, it, it, it's a great question, and, it, and it's so hard. I mean, it's hard for me personally because, you know, I try to be on social media to kind of get myself out there, but I feel like I don't engage with 95% of stuff that's on my feed because it's, it's so divisive. And the research bears that out. So we actually have a, a paper we just finished writing up about moral panics. And so you can think about moral panics through time, like reefer madness, Dungeons and Dragons, playing heavy metal music backwards, making kids, you know, satanic. There's all sorts of moral panics through the ages, right, that people really worried about. And they've, like, basically, you know, they melted away, uh, many of them. Uh, and some of them didn't. And it turns out that moral panics back in the day, a certain number of conditions had to be met. So, like, the media elites had to talk about it, right? It had to be, like, on the news, like, next, your kids are listening to heavy metal and worshiping Satan. Right? And then you're like, oh my God, right? And then you like talk to your neighbors, right? So there's like a whole big thing for these moral panics. But it turns out now that social media is like a, a petri dish, right? The perfect kind of like growing medium for moral panics. And in 2004, uh, Slate magazine published the, this thing was like, or, why, I think it was Slate. It was like year of, of moral panics or whatever and moral outrage. And then, the, and then a couple years later, they're like, Ac actually, th this is also the year. <laughs> it's still, still the year. And then, you know, obviously every year. So every day um, on, on social media, you have the conditions for a moral panic, which are some threats that we're worried about, right? Like this bad thing is happening. Like the other party is doing this thing or kids are doing this thing. And then what, ha and then you see it go viral. So those metrics, right? Like the retweets or the shares or the likes. It's not just like some dumb thing. It's like now 10,000 people are seeing this and you just think, whoa, that's scary. And then what do you do? You, you use the only thing that you can use on social media to combat it because you can't like drive to those people's houses or whatever, or like, you know, call them. So instead you express your moral outrage. I can't believe this is happening. No, 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 no. Right. And then there's the outrage expression. Then people see that as a threat. And then they get outraged about your thing because like you're threatening. And then you get this like cycle of, of moral panics. So we, we documented this on Twitter. Uh, we invented our own, own moral panic, which is very fun. Um, we, we didn't unleash it on social media. This is in a lab. Uh, it, it's called dizzy dogging. You gotta be careful. Everyone's dizzy dogging. Um, Basically, we show that uh, people get laser pointers and they make their dogs spin around, but they spin around so fast that they get dizzy, and then they film it as dogs fall downstairs and bump into furniture. Terrible. Terrible. The kids these days, right? Dizzy dogging. Hashtag dizzy dogging. Um, and so we basically, you know, we invented this. We gave it to people in the lab. We didn't actually film dogs falling down the stairs. We just told people this is what was happening, right? And then, and then we paired it with like virality metrics, right? So like this has been retweeted 10,000 times. And if you read that and you think this is a threat, then you're like, oh, those dizzy dogging errs. Or whatever. I don't know what you'd call the people who do that, right? We need to get them, right? Like I'm calling God, right? And so you can just like invent these things. It's so easy, right? You just need threat and virality and then people are so outraged. So I think the, the, the solution is one, I mean, stay away if you can, but we can't. Um, and two, just recognize that like these threats are mostly manufactured and they're not as bad as you think they are. And, and, and recognize that like the, the social media news cycle is like a day. Like it's the attention span of a goldfish, you know? And so even if it's viral now, it's going to disappear tomorrow. Um, it doesn't mean the threat is not a threat anymore, um, but it's going to disappear. And the other thing I say is like don't look at it in, in your bed, no. right? So it used to be like, you, you know, threats were out there. Or you like read the paper and they'll be like on your kitchen table and then you're like, oh, you know, this is bullshit. I'm going to bed. And then you're like in bed and you're like. Bzz, bzz. And then it's in your dreams. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And then it's like literally in your bed. Like imagine I was like, imagine the worst threat in the world and it's in your bed with you. Like, is it a snake? No, it's your smartphone. Right. And so just keep your like imagine it's like a snake. Uh, keep it outside the bed. <laughs>
So this actually, this got me to thinking about this piece that you wrote this past January. So listen up to the title of this piece. It is, People Seem Evil Because the World Has Gotten Better and Then a Bit Worse Suddenly. So you know where I'm going with this, I think. So in it, you talk about why we see so many villains, supposed villains today, despite the idea that society's actually gotten, you know, a little bit better. So how does this relate to our struggles to, you know, I don't know, exercise respect and compassion toward each other, toward those we disagree with in particular, because right. everything and everyone is a villain. But I love the, I don't know if you're willing to share the personal piece that you put in there about your own like childhood experience with bullying, um, but how that pertains to this. I just thought that was really um, impactful. What right. bullying was, yes, you know, back in the day and what bullying is defined as today. Oh, yeah. Um, not to be w weird and not say I don't remember my path. Is this the Englands? Yes. It, yeah, okay. Uh, not that I've been bullied a couple times. <laughs> so uh, there's been lots of discussion about the kind of like creep of harm, the kind of like victimhood culture. So I, I teach college kids and some people say like, are college kids snowflakes? Like they're worried about everything's like victimized. Everything is harmful. And, you know, my kind of understanding of the moral mind is that it's all kind of fundamentally based on, on being concerned about harm. But it is the case that the world is less dangerous than it was 100, 200, 1,000 years ago, right? You, like in the midst of evolution, life expectancy was very low and the threats were very clear. They were like saber-toothed cats and diseases that cut us down in our 20s, right? Like you'd be walking down the street, like we didn't have streets, right? We'd be walking down the kind of path and then like your friend would disappear and get eaten by a jaguar, right? Like that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and, and there's more safety regulations, right? There's seat belts and there's amazing medical techniques, right? And, and so the world is generally safer than it was. But, but we still have this mind that like detects harm, right? That, that's, we're kind of like hardwired to see threats in the world. And so that means is if the threats that we're actually threatening are no longer that threatening, then we see new ones, right? We see new ones that are maybe not as not as bad as they used to be, like n not that severe, but they loom large, right? So like, you know, we have kids, and, and when I grew up, I used to like, you know, uh, John Hyde and Greg, we cannot make this claim, right? Uh, among others, like I used to bike around my neighborhood until dark and just do whatever, right? And now with my kids, I'm like, I don't know, is it safe? I mean, they're a lot younger than I was, but like, I'm still like, I don't know, is it safe? I'm like, it's safer now than it's ever been. And yet I still worry as a parent, right? And collectively, we all worry about our kids uh, and, and grandkids. Because now it's safer, we worry more. And that seems crazy, right? But, but our evolution of kind of how we understand threat has evolved. And so the, the one uh, story I had was my dad was in the Navy. And he got posted uh, to this place, Bristol in the UK. And I lived in this place called Bath. Long story, I went to this like fancy private school because the Canadian government had to like do a good, as good a school as I had in Canada, and they thought this was a good enough school. But it's a fancy private school, think like Lord of the Flies, uh, before they got on the island though. It's just, you know, uh, we weren't on the island, we were just, that's like their internal character. And so we played this game called Headers, Volleys, and Beats, and I was 13. It was like a fun time to move somewhere new. Um, and so the Headers, Volleys, and Beats, there's like all boys school, like 15 boys, and the game is that one person's in goal, and you have to score on them three times in a row from a header, someone kicks it up and you hit it in, or a volley, someone kicks it up and they kick it in. And if you score on the person in goal three times in a row without them getting the ball and tagging someone else, then everyone who's playing gets to punch them as hard as they can. That's the game, right? Yeah, rule Britannia. Yeah, that's like how it was in England. Uh, and so I was the Canadian. I was, you know, wasn't short on talking back. And so I often get picked in goal, and I got punched a lot. Uh, in the arm, not in the face. Like, always in the arm. And, then, you know, they mastered the dead arm. So I'm just, you know, and your arm would kind of, like, hanging down in biology period because it would be just, like, totally punched. And, it, and I was just like, yeah, that, that is like, that, that's the game they play. But it, if my daughter came home and told me, like, hey, we played this, this game at school, and they just, like, punched my arm until it went numb... I would be like, that's not acceptable, right? And so there's this, been this creep of harm, this evolution of what we think is harmful, right? Then I thought it was a game. Now I think it's like incredible bullying. 
But again, it's because the world is generally safer. And if we see more harm, then we see more people inflicting that harm, intentionally inflicting that harm, and those are villains, right? People who intentionally inflict harm are villains. So thinking back with my kind of like current moral understanding uh, of like, you know, having kids, I think like, are they all villains? Are they all bullies? Maybe. Or, right, they were just like, we're playing the game that they always played at this British private school, and I just kind of stood out as a Canadian. So I'm actually not quite sure how I think of it. You know, like, toughen me up, maybe. You know, like, still my arm drags. No, it's not true. Um, but, but certainly our, our understanding of harm evolves. Oh, looks like we've got a question. No, is it question time? Yes, it's question time. <laughs> I'm trying to read the nonverbal cues back there. <laughs> Eliza's doing the YMCA. So we'll take some questions from the audience. If anybody has a question so far, we've got one right here in the middle. Eliza's coming behind you with the microphone. Also, you've got your little question forms in the middle of the table that we always have. If you want to write out a question and just hold it up, go for it. Okay, hi, I'm Lee, and thank you for your share. It was wonderful. Okay, real life situation. Let's say that I'm volunteering for a nonprofit organization, working with a woman beside me, and we chat, and I know she's a good person because she's volunteering with the nonprofit. We talk about our children. I see that she's a great parent, blah, 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 blah. Suddenly, the conversation turns to politics. And I immediately I realized that she's with the other team. What do you do when, I, when you feel yourself bristle? You know, everything about the good part of her that you've, you know, recognized just disappears, and the only thought is, oh, my gosh, she's on the other team. Mm -hmm. What can you do right at that moment to change that? Yeah, it's a great question uh, and something that comes up a lot in our daily lives. So I think the, the first thing to do is, is not say anything about politics right away, right? Because don't do anything right away. So I work with this, um, with this practitioner who, who, who bridges divides in like real conflict zones. And, and he basically has this, this line that's like, the, the human body can like adrenalize itself for flight or f flight, fl flight or fight, uh, yeah, I can't say it, but within a millisecond. Like in the time it took me to say that, like four times, like you could just, you could be adrenalized immediately, right? And so you get that, like, oh my God, like, we're, let's do this, right? Uh, or let's run away. And I think the, the best thing to do is to not say anything right then, because it takes probably 15 minutes for us to calm down after we get adrenalized. And maybe you don't think of her as a bear you need to fight, right? So maybe it's not that severe, but you certainly get this, like, initial reaction. So I think the first thing you do is you just take a breath. Right, and you just hold up, count to four. My kids watch this Daniel Tiger show, and they say, when you're feeling like you're gonna roar, take a deep breath and count to four. Uh, and, you know, by God, it's a great advice for toddlers and for grown-ups uh, like us. So I think just pause uh, a little bit and take a deep breath. And then I think that you can think of two things. One, you can think of... Uh, of how you want to think back on that, like when, when you're talking about it later on with, with friends or family, right? Like what, what, would, what would your best self do in that circumstance? Like what would you be proud of doing there? And, and, and think about that a little bit, right? And, you know, maybe you're like, and the proud thing would be to like eviscerate her. Uh, ho hopefully not if we're here, right? And oftentimes I think of like, what, you know, what would my ideal self be? Like, I don't want to just be right. I want to, I want to like think of myself in a, in a good way. And so usually that's slightly different. And the, the second thing you can do is you can, you can try to learn. Is that if the first thing you do isn't to make a statement but ask a question, I think that can go a long way to making you calm down and humanizing her, right? She's like, well, this is what I think about abortion. How come? What made you think that? Right, and it gives her a chance to explain where she's coming from. Now it's not a fight; it's it's a chance to learn. It's a chance to learn. And I actually I, I do have some research on this. The the final thing you can do, so you can take a deep breath, uh, you can ask a question, you can think about your ideal self, and you can share an experience. So it turns out that that um, I ran this study and I asked Americans like, what would make you respect someone who had a different political view than you, and 
a uh, representative sample of Americans said facts. If they gave me the facts without any kind of editorializing, I would respect the other person. Then we'd have a common ground of facts. Well, a representative sample of Americans are totally wrong because it is not true, right? You're just like, those facts are not facts. Those are fake facts. You made that shit up. I do not believe you, right? That is wrong. And so, like, and then, right, like, that's not a great place to start a conversation. So it turns out what, what works is a personal experience. So we're sharing personal experience. And remember, we talked about harm, particularly about harm. So we run all these studies in the lab. We ran a lot about gun rights. And we had a confederate, an undergraduate, talk to a passerby like yourself. And they say, what do you think about guns? And you're like, oh, I'm pro-gun control. And then the confederate says, I don't know how anyone could think that. That's un-American, and here's why, right? Like, thems are fighting words. And then they say, here's why, here's some facts, or here's a personal experience. We had a person break into our house, and my mom used a gun to defend herself. Now, that personal experience diffused the situation because you made yourself vulnerable, you ground your beliefs in a kind of, in something that's true to you, and it's about harm. So I think if you want to volunteer something that's not asking a question, you can volunteer a personal experience that explains why you believe that way, right? Something in your life. So, right, breathe, ask a question, and then talk about your experiences and not fact at first. It's a great question. Yeah, and I think the other beautiful thing that comes out of an experience like that, even, even before you get to the three-step program that Kurt just described, or if you don't have the opportunity to, is just that reminder that, Okay, when you are taking that deep breath is that I already, you know, like this person for all these other reasons because they're volunteering where I do. We have that shared, you know, interest in something. So it breaks down that initial sometimes, you know, unfortunate human reaction we have to feeling those bristly feelings towards someone who is on the opposite side of, especially if it's a very hot button issue for us. And to remind ourselves that the other side is not to be just like globally disdained. <laughs> you know, they have lots of good qualities too, just like we do. And yeah, it's really just, I think, part of the chipping away and at the human experience. And um, you can have some really wonderful things that come out of that when you're open to it. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. That was wonderful. Eliza, do we have another question? Yeah, we actually have several questions from audience members. Here's one. You speak about concern about harm, our need to protect ourselves from harm. Is this how fear motivates us? Yes. Yep, exactly. This is why fear is such a powerful motivator, right? Threat. Threat is, is one of the most powerful things in, in our human nature, right? And when we feel threatened, we not only um, act to protect ourselves, but feel a self-righteous. And, and when we feel like a victim, then we also feel blameless, right? And so one thing I, I didn't talk about but that, that I study is kind of harm, right, has this kind of structure of like a victimizer and a victim, you know, child abuse has like the, the abuser and the, and the kid, right? Theft has like the thief and the person who's stolen from. And so we, we really think of the world, the moral world, in terms of these two roles, victimizer and victim. And so if you feel like a victim, then it means like you can't be the victimizer, right? You're not the bad person here. And it licenses you to do whatever you want, right? So there's so many like geopolitical conflicts, right? Where one person harm, you know, one side harms another side and the, and the one side, the other side's like, look, I'm the victim here. And then they harm back. Like, we're just, we're just defending ourselves. Preemptive strike to defend ourselves. And the, and the other side's like, look, you just aggress against us. Now we're aggressing against you. And so in geopolitical conflict, you can see this all the time, right? In our daily lives too, right? Maybe you say something offhand to your spouse. You weren't really thinking about it, right? Like they feel aggrieved. That was unjustified. They say something really snarky back, and you're like, what? I just said something offhand, and now you're coming at me? Right? I'm the victim. And then your spouse thinks, like, I'm the victim, right? And when everyone thinks they're the victim, no one's the victimizer, and then it just gets derailed, right? And so, uh, yeah. It, and fear, it, <laughs> I'll tell you a story with me and my spouse about fear, right? That, like, hits at home. So I was upstairs in our bedroom. The lights were off because our kids just went to bed, keeping it dark. And she went upstairs, you know, also with the lights off. And so, like, I was coming out of the room looking this way. She was coming out. And we bumped into each other. Like, oh, my God. Right? 
And we both were like, what are you doing? Are you, are you crazy? You scared the hell out of me, right? And we both thought the other person was wrong because we were both fr- afraid, right? So like our fear made us think that the other person's a, you know, a terrible person who was doing something wrong when we were both, you know, just <laughs> trying to find our way in the dark, which is a pretty good analogy for, for us in our lives. Yeah. My question is this. Um, the pandemic has created these moral divides, right? Republican Party saying, hey, and proven right that they put kids back in school because it really didn't hurt kids, right? They did very well. And at the same time, the Democratic Party was very right that um, they really needed to protect older adults. And so you're saying after this is all over, from a moral perspective, we have to go back and tell stories. I don't think that's going to be the way that we get back together. And so I'm wondering if you guys are doing any research to say something as big and powerful as the pandemic. How are we going to dissect that and bring that together? Yeah. <laughs> the pandemic is is a big, ugly thing. But I'm not sure that stories aren't going to do it. But maybe, maybe not just stories. But I think you summed it up really well there, right? Is it like everyone is a little bit right and, and, a, and a little bit wrong when it comes to their concerns about harm, right? So... Parents were really worried about kids, and as you say, like ki- kids didn't do so bad, right? They weren't that affected. But then there were other vulnerable people who who really were harmed, right? And so I think if we can come at it with some humility, as we've been talking about here, right? Like maybe you know maybe I was wrong about elderly folks. Maybe I was wrong about kids. Yeah, you need to emphasize these different harms and realize that each person is trying to kind of like do the best they can. And even like anti-maskers, right? I think. Governmental tyranny, I just read this piece about like governments using spyware in like all our smartphones. I'm like, you know, government spying and overreach is a thing, right? Like the nation was founded on kind of like concerns about government tyranny. So if you believe that, right, maybe it's a little more far-fetched, but I think you can still see the humanity in folks like that. That's a great question. All right, the question is, how did compromise become bad and how do we move forward without compromise? Yeah. I don't think we can move forward without compromise. I think, so I'm a, I'm a psychologist, right? I study kind of like everyday people's beliefs. But we, we can't really think about this without also thinking about institutions um, in which we live. And so institutions like cable news networks, social media, right? Those are the things, elites, the existence of primaries, which are happening right now, the two-party system, right? I don't want to get all like political science, right? But there's like all sorts of structures in America that, that are made to reinforce kind of divisions and make compromise seem like a bad thing. And so I think the thing to do is not only understand yourself as like someone who can have more civil conversations, but also as an, as an agent of, of change. And, and I'm not even talking partisan things, right? In North Carolina now, there's a bipartisan measure to have different uh, rank choice ballots to get less extreme folks elected. And I, I think, you know, those are things that you can kind of like work towards uh, and, and do, like use news sources that are less polarized if you can, right? Like engage with different social media platforms. So you're, you know, you can make choices with how you consume media and, and how you vote and how you give your money, for instance, to, to increase um, compromise. But it's a great question. Before we move on to another um, audience question, I want to switch gears just for a moment uh, with you, Kurt, because you know, partial, giving a plug to your book that we have back there in the corner. So if you all have seen um, Kurt's book, it's been a few years now, I'll let him tell you more about it, that he wrote it, but it is really incredible. And it is called The Mind Club, Who Thinks, What Feels, and Why It Matters. It is a very interesting book. It kind of hurts your mind a little bit at times, <laughs> I think, to really wrap it around. But I was just wondering if you could give us just a little, you know, a little quick insider sneak peek into that and kind of what led you to writing it with your co-author and what it's all about. Sure. So the kind of basis of a lot of the research that I'm doing now, there's like this fundamental philosophical fact, I was ripping on philosophers a little bit, but it's called the problem of other minds. And I think it's a problem that that gives rise to all sorts of problems in our daily lives and in America, and that is that you don't know what other people are thinking, and you especially don't know what they're feeling, right? So, so there's this thought experiment, which is 
Imagine that everyone at your table is a zombie. And not the kind of like shambling, you know, brain-eating kind of zombie, but, but someone like a Stepford wife who looks and talks just like you, but there's actually nothing there behind their eyes. It's just dead space and maybe a microchip somewhere back there. Right? And when someone tells you they love you, you can't know that for sure. Right? You can't even know if they're even capable of love. This is the problem of other, it goes back to like Descartes basically, right? And so that, that's the kind of like fun version of it, right? But it matters in all sorts of ways that we, we, we can't really understand the minds of others. And so fetuses, right? Can they feel? Well, that's a really important question right now, right? Is, is a fetus more like a, is a baby or, or a mindless mass of dividing cells? Is a dog a person? A hundred years ago, people used to pay money to see animals tear each other apart, right? Bear baiting, it was like, you know, get a bear out there and eat a horse and a monkey on a horse, right? Like crazy stuff, right? And, and right now we spend more money on our pets oftentimes than our children. So we've like really gone a long way, right? But does a dog feel? I don't know. Do enemies feel? Does someone in a vegetative state? What about God, right? We're in a church. What does God think right now? But if you think that smoking weed is awesome, you think that God also thinks that smoking weed is awesome, right? So it turns out that we also create God in our own image in many ways, right? So it's basically an exploration of, of, of who's in the mind club, so who has a mind, and how we make sense of the minds of others. Um, and how I got to write it, so I, I studied kind of how we understand the minds of others, and um, this whole book was actually an exercise in understanding the mind of my advisor. So the first author, uh, yeah, the, the first author, it, is Daniel M. Wegner, and he was my advisor. And so we worked together on a lot of these things through grad school. He was my advisor at Harvard. And just after I started a, a, a job at the University of Maryland, I came back and he said, look, uh, I have this like weakness in my, in my fingers, and I'm not sure what it is. It's probably nothing. It might be ALS. Well, it turned out it was ALS, yeah. And so he said, look, I, I started the first chapter of this book. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish it. And if I'm not, we've done a lot of this work together, and I would, I would like you to finish it if you can. And he said, this is a, <laughs> he always has a like, funny way of saying these things. So he says, this is a terrible idea for you as a, as a junior professor. You need to write papers, publish or perish. You've like, heard of that, right? Like, you shouldn't write this book. And I don't want you to think of this as a last request from a dying man. <laughs> but it is. You finished the book for me. So I, obviously I finished the book. And so, and, and so as I wrote this book, it was really a chance for me to kind of like, you know, and we kind of like went back and forth talking about it. And then he became too sick to write it after still only finishing the first chapter. But, and we had a conversation. I was like, how about 60-40 since I have to write 90% of the book? And he was like, how about 50-50? <laughs> we'll call it a deal. So we called it a deal because you're not going to argue with a dying man. That sounds like compromise. That's a compromise. <laughs> yeah, I wrote the book. So, but it was, a, it was a pleasure to write it, kind of like simulating his, his mind and, and what he would think. So we kind of like wrote it together, uh, even if I, you know, actually like put the words down on paper. So That's very cool. I've got my copy. I'm getting my signature. <laughs> Did we have another question? My, my question is, is that we all want to be really good and uh, while we're being humble uh, and to really be objective in how we look at the media but if we look at the cable channels and the different things that we hit on the web, there's people manipulating us uh, in order to increase the fear and the hatred. And how can we train ourselves, prepare ourselves to be more objective consumers of these messages and help our kids do the same? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an important question, and it's important to, especially as you mentioned, train our kids to be savvy consumers of, of the media. And it turns out that there's a, there's a lot of folks who are working on this. You know, there are people who have rated the news sources for how objective they are, for the kind of like objectivity and, and partisan bias. And so one thing you can do is you can go on different news sites and kind of like triangulate. Not everyone has the time or the stomach uh, for that, but... But there are tools where you can go just like, well, what's relatively un unbiased, right? And it turns out that like the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal are less biased than Breitbart, 
right? And like maybe if that's news to you, then then uh, I'm glad I told you. But there there are lots of cases where there's like better or worse news sites. Go on those, and there's other tools. So there's one there's a computer scientist slash more political scientist actually named Chris Bale at Duke, and I like hesitate to say anything good about Duke because I'm a Tar Heel. Uh, but he has these apps. Uh, if you use Twitter, that basically tells you like how much in an echo chamber are you. So it analyzes your kind of like Twitter connections and says like, yep, yeah, you follow all progressive academics, for instance, in my case, because I use it for research. Or, you know, you only follow super right-wing folks or whatever, right? So you can kind of like get some diagnosis. Um, but again, you need some humility because you need to be like, am I consuming partisan news sources? And sometimes when I, you know, I subscribe to the Times, when I go to the Times, and I read it. Sometimes I, I go to more conservative news sources, right? I, like Wall Street Journal or, or even Fox News. I'm like, what's Fox News saying about this? Um, and it's usually very different, but it's just nice at least to see a kind of like different opinion on it. Yeah. All right. So we all have our marching orders from Kurt. We know what to do and get out there and do it. But that's going to be it for us this evening. We've reached our time. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insights. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> hey there, it's Vanessa back with you. Are we all feeling a little more humble at this very moment? I definitely am. I found this program so thought provoking that it's actually consumed my thoughts over the last week. So I'm going to go through a couple of quick reflections of mine. First, remember that woman who asked the great question about what to do when you feel yourself bristle up when you're with someone on, quote unquote, the other side? Well, my answer is get primed to handle situations like that by listening to every episode we put out here on Village Squarecast. Now, I know that sounds like a self-serving plug, but it's really not for real. It's my honest answer about what can help because of my own experience. My crash course of 50 plus Village Square programs over two years has led me to this place where I no longer bristle in situations like that. I no longer have anger towards the people on the other side. And actually, now I find situations like that fascinating as I try to make sense of how people arrived at their beliefs. But here in full disclosure, I will have to admit to you that I still get super fired up about the political tactics and games that are used to manipulate us. So maybe that's next on the journey for me, learning how to turn that fury into something more productive. TBD on that, you guys. Moving on to cats and dogs. I've got two cats and a dog, and I definitely like to question that science Kurt referenced about dogs being smarter, all based on my own personal experience. So both my cats run away from the car when we pull in the driveway, while the dog wants to circle the car while it's still moving because he's so eager to greet us. The cats know exactly what they can and can't eat to keep from getting sick, while the dog is probably going to bankrupt us with vet bills due to eating everything he's not supposed to. Our cat's the best hunter in the house, but don't tell my husband who started hunting when he was eight. I could go on and on, but the point is, here I am, someone who considers herself very logical and science-based, but because I have a personal experience that seems counter to the science, I'm super skeptical. And by the way, my personal experience is based on like the smallest sample group possible. And I just listened to a program on humility and being wrong. So isn't it amazing how powerful our personal experiences and feelings can be? Why on earth am I still questioning the science? Okay, finally, this is the big one because it leaves you with a question to ponder. One of my favorite Village Squarecast episodes is Order, Chaos, and Homo Sapiens. It's episode 45. My mind was blown right off the bat when one of the panelists, Bo Weingard, 
was introduced as a centrist with slightly conservative social opinions and slightly liberal economic views. I didn't know people like that existed. And to my great surprise, he proceeded to impress me in a big way, like throughout the program. One of the things I loved the most was that Bo said that if he was running for office, he'd be the party of, I don't know, because he hasn't explored every issue to the extent necessary to make a good call, so he'd have to figure it all out issue by issue while in office. He also said that he's not 100% sure about any of his beliefs, so he welcomes the opportunity to debate it. Brilliant. And I wish we allowed for more of that in our politics. Now here's the twist. Bo has since been canceled over his unusual perspective on immigration. And after hearing Bo speak about that on our podcast episode, I just have to question whether the people leading the charge to cancel him actually took the time to listen to his perspectives and think deeply about what he was saying. Now, I'm not saying that Bo is right. I'm just completely puzzled that people could think he's so off base that he deserves to be canceled. So here's the big question that I'm going to leave you with today. How do we be both humble and open about our viewpoints without risking being canceled? Do we have to keep from rocking the boat publicly and save the questioning or the unpopular thought for private interactions? That would be sad to me, but that's kind of what's on my mind right now. If you have thoughts about this or anything else we explored today or really ever, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. There's a contact form at the bottom of our website at villagesquare.us. That's also where you can sign up for our newsletter, which is the best way to stay up to date with all that's happening at the Village Square. We'd like to give another big thank you to Florida Humanities for partnering with us to present this podcast series. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Village Squarecast wherever you listen to podcasts and drop us a review. They really do help. We appreciate you listening to Intellectual Humility in a Polarized World with Dr. Kurt Gray. Until next time, we challenge you to reach out with an open heart and mind to someone who doesn't look or think like you. It changes everything. We'll talk to you soon, and thanks so much for listening to Village Squarecast. Cast.